We are looking at Psalm 103 today, underneath the title, Praise the Lord, He Has Mercy on His Children. Let's begin by reading Psalm 103 and then moving right into our prayer. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise His holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As the Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. And then a prayer from the hymn. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. It soothes our sorrows, heals our wounds, and drives away all fear. O Jesus, shepherd, guardian, friend, my prophet, priest, and king, my Lord, my life, my way, my end, I accept the praise I bring. Amen. All right, our usual first question, which I think is an easy one. What type of psalm is Psalm 103? Praise and thanksgiving, yes. And then it's also a didactic, yeah. So it's those two. Praise, Thanksgiving Psalm. We get that in the very first two verses. Praise, praise. And then also a didactic psalm because it teaches us about who God is. It gives us some qualities and characteristics of God. How he operates. Okay. So this is a, mainly a praise but also didactic. Let's flip the page. Number two. David reminds us to not forget all of God's benefits. Think of biblical examples of ingratitude, as well as some of your own personal failures to thank God. So any biblical examples of ingratitude? You got something, else? Sure, yeah, all the idols that false, and false gods. That's a form of ingratitude, right? They're, we're worshiping false gods instead of the true God. We're not thankful to the true God. Can you think of any other examples of ingratitude? Mm. Yeah, the, what the Pharisees did as far as, you know, their relationship with Jesus and 
well, we don't really need Jesus. We're going to kind of do it ourselves. That's ingratitude for everything Jesus was going to do. Peter? Yeah, well, that was probably quite a few of them, but we get that in Isaiah with King Ahaz. When Isaiah comes to him and says, hey, ask for a sign, and, and the king's like, nah, it's all right. And then that's where we get the famous, well, the Lord's going to give you a sign. The virgin will, be, will conceive and give birth to a son, and we'll call him Emmanuel. Um, so it's a sign. We love that verse because it's talking about Jesus, but the king didn't even want to hear it. Ryan, do you have... Yeah, there are quite a few times with the children of Israel in the wilderness uh, right away when they were at the Red Sea, and they're like, what did you bring us out here for just to die? And then there were some other times, um, some couple of rebellions against Moses when uh, uh, he had the, the snakes that, that God sent after their ingratitude. Um, even like you could think of uh, when Moses is on Mount Sinai, he comes back down and they're worshiping the golden calf. <laughs> uh, yeah, so those 40 years are pretty bad with ingratitude. Not usually a question that I ask myself is examples of ingratitude in Scripture, but can you think of any others? Mark? Sure. Well, it, it appears that they didn't have a lot of those to feed. There was probably like a million and a half people, and so there, there wasn't enough. It, you could probably kill all your animals, and then you'd just be, then you wouldn't have anything. You would, because, I mean, sheep and stuff are mainly used for their wool. Goats are mainly used for their milk. Um, I don't know how much cattle they would have had in the desert. For their offerings? Yeah, they would have used them for their offerings, um, although they didn't always use cattle for offerings. They used a lot of smaller animals instead. Any other examples of ingratitude? I can think of like the, the parable of the prodigal son, like the older brother was, in, was uh, not grateful for, to his father. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. The older brother was mad that his little brother was back home and dad was treating him nice. You could even say that the younger brother was in, was not thankful because he left in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, the, the parable of the, the rich farmer. Remember that one with, uh, he got all this, he had a really good bounty one year and he's like, well, I'm just going to, Eat, drink, and be merry, and God comes to him and says, You fool, this very night your soul will be demanded from you. He wasn't grateful to God. Any other? We hit quite a few. There's got to be more. I'm trying to think of some more New Testament ones. Yeah, I don't care. Young man in Oh, yeah. He couldn't do it, and he was told to give up his possessions and his riches. Yeah, the, the rich young ruler, when, when God said, you know, you're still holding on. He's, basically, Jesus said, you, you still have one idol, and that's your wealth. Give it up. And he went away sad because he owned much. Yeah. I'm trying to think. One more. One, one more good one to... Put us over the top. There you go, rich man, and poor Lazarus. Yeah. yeah, let's do that one. So yeah, that the rich man had a bunch, and and uh, he showed his ingratitude to the Lord by not sharing. That's good. Okay, so there are there are plenty of examples of ingratitude in. Uh, Scriptures. Number three, list the benefits David encourages us to remember in verses three through five 
and explain how God gives these benefits. All right, three through five. What are the benefits that God gives? Because David says, praise the Lord, forget not all of his benefits, and in three through five he lists all of them, or some of them. He takes away our guilt. What else does he do in three through five? Heals our diseases. Saved us from the pit. Redeems us. Redeems our life from the pit. Gives us a crown of love and compassion. And then verse five. Satisfies our desires with good things. So he blesses us with, with earthly things here in this life. Okay. Quite a list. How does God give these benefits to us? Because we don't go up, you know, every morning we don't go to the church doors and pick up our good things, and we don't go and pick up our crowns from the church door every morning and, and the forgiveness of sins and and uh you know, we don't stand outside and when we're sick and, and then get healed. So how does, how does that work? Through prayer? Yeah. In his love for us, certainly. In his public forgiveness every time we come to church. Yeah, right? We, we, we go to God's word. God, give, God in his word gives us all of these things through Jesus. How do I get my forgiveness of sins? Well, that's through Jesus. Um, heals all your diseases. Well, you could be talking about, because it's paired with forgive all your sins, David could be referring to, you know, the disease of sins, but, you know, God does heal our diseases, sicknesses. How does he do that? What does he use? Gives us doctors and, and medicine and hospitals and things like that. Gives us knowledge, and some people are very knowledgeable and good at those kinds of things. Uh, redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. That's another, you know, think of Jesus there. Satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. How does he satisfy our desires with good things? What's that? Yeah, and how does he give us those things? Like, like when I go outside, you know, if I want a car, I, I don't just say, God, next time I'm outside, it'd be great if I had a car just kind of parked out there. Yeah, he gives us the ability to do things, to work, to have jobs. He gives us parents before that. Um, he, he, he blesses, you know, our nation and he blesses our economy and, and things like that. So he, he, he works through, the point of this is he works through, through supernatural means, um, like his word, but he also works through normal means, you know, with, with the giving us the ability to do things. He gives us patience to carry on when our burdens are heavy. He gives us patience to carry on when our burdens are heavy. Yeah, so that's for sure. Number four. Exodus 34, 6 and 7, which is quoted in verse 8, was Israel's Old Testament equivalent of John 3, 16. This is where God is telling Moses his name where he says, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents of the third and fourth generation. And then goes on to say, but shows love to a thousand generations of those who love him. The passage pretty well describes the spiritual roller coaster ride of Israel. The people rebelled against God time after time. 
Yet he was compassionate and gracious. He filled their lives with blessings and showered them with his love and forgiveness. When he did discipline them, it was obvious that he was trying to draw them to himself and teach them to trust in him. You know, read the book of Judges. You see that just over and over and over again. How do we apply these Old Testament words from Exodus 34 to our own lives? The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love. How do we apply those to our own lives? Or if you want to maybe clarify that question a bit, when we read the book of Judges and 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles, why is that recorded? For us, I mean that happened. Let's see how long ago did that happen? That would have been twenty, no, three thousand five hundred years ago, right? Yeah, thousand A.D. or thousand B.C. was David, and that was before David. So yeah, three thousand five hundred years ago. Why, what's the point of going through the book of Judges today? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Those 600 years of living underneath the judges and then the the years after of living under kings but especially those years underneath the judges um it, it's a it's really the same you know, nothing has changed as far as our attitudes of sin we when things are going well it's kind of like well we lose track a little bit of of the lord and what does the lord have to do he has to get us back on there so and that usually means he needs to send a trouble of some sort our way to get us refocused. So the, our first reaction when trouble hits is to grumble and complain. And then we wake up and we're like, yeah, that, yeah okay, now I know <laughs> what's going on here. Forgive me, Lord. He forgives us and he blesses us. And then that cycle kind of keeps happening throughout our lives, just like it did in the generations uh, for 600 years underneath the judges. But when, and so when you look at Exodus 34, you can't help but say, you know, this is my God too. You know, he punishes me for my sins or disciplines me is usually the word we use. But at the same time, he draws me back to himself because he is compassionate and gracious. He, he's slow to anger. He, he, you know, what, what should God do to me? He should just send me to hell, but he doesn't. Because he's abounding in love and faithfulness. He maintains his love. He forgives. I kind of like the way the, the three words he uses. He forgives wickedness. So just wickedness is usually like outright just blatant sin. Rebellion, which is usually a, like when God talks about rebellion, it's a sin against the first commandment. And then sin. So just like the catch-all word, everything else that's bad. He forgives all those things. So big sins, small sins, he forgives them all. Number five, what wonderful God, what a wonderful God we have. In verses 9 through 14, we see one beautiful truth after another. Think of at least one way each of the verses applies to your life. Okay, so we've got quite a few verses. We're going to do, actually, I guess, 9 to 16 is what we're going to do. And for each verse... We have to apply that to ourselves. And maybe some of these verses might be a little personal application that you don't want to say out loud so we can come up with some kind of generic ones too. But think about you personally. Don't just think in a generic way. Think about your life. Um, you don't have to say those out loud, but as we're going through this, think about them. Number, verse 9. How does this apply to you? He will not always accuse nor will he harbor his anger forever. How, how is that applied to our lives? 
one way each of these verses applies to our lives. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. Our past sins are in the past, yeah. God remembers them no more. Do you ever, um, Alvin, are you going to say something? I kind of saw your hand twitch. Okay. Uh, you ever feel like, boy, God's really got his hand on me right now, and not in a good way, not in a comforting way, but in a, maybe in some time in your life where it was like, wow, this is really intense pressure that's on me. Um, we, have the, we have the assurance from God that that will not always be the case. That when he applies his hand of discipline upon us, it's for a very specific reason and for, and for a specific set time um, to wake us up. And then his hand is, is taken back. So he's, he is not, he will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. Which is kind of a neat picture when you think about it. That idea of like a harbor of like sinking your, your uh, why can't I think of what that's called? Anchor, putting your anchor into the harbor and just staying there. God's anger won't just stay against you forever. Um, let's see. Let's apply verse 10. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Okay, that one's a little probably easy to apply to our lives. How do we apply that to our lives? He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. If God did treat us as our sins deserve, we'd all be going to hell. And even... What about this side of earth? It would be very, very miserable. God could make this life of ours, if he wanted to treat us as our sins deserve, we, it would not be a good life. We would have no blessings. Number 11. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. How does that, how do we apply that to our lives? As high as the heavens are above the earth, that's how great his love is. It's immeasurable. What's that? It's immeasurable. Yeah, God's love is immeasurable. That's really the point of this. It's not, God's not saying, well, you know, look at, you know, if you, and today we could do this, you know, look at how high this, you know, the sky is before you get into space. You know, that's how much God actually loves us, whatever, how many miles that is. Like, that's not the point. The point is, it's immeasurable. As high as a, especially if you're standing there looking up into the sky, it's immeasurable. How else do we apply that to ourselves? As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. It's a complete, it's a complete love. Eric. He, he, there's nothing missing from his love. It's hard to comprehend his love. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, we're not even capable of understanding his love. The small, I mean, think about that. I think we understand his love, right? If I said, "Does God love you?" You say, "Yes, He does." You understand that, and yet at the same time, you don't understand how much God actually loves you. It's impossible for us to understand that. That's kind of neat, actually. When you like, when you get down to it, when when you process that, I, you know, no matter how much I think I know how much God loves me, I, it's not it's not it's not enough. He loves me even more than that. Let's see, number twelve. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. What's the personal application there? How far is east from west? Yeah, we can't. What did you say, Ellen? A long ways. In fact, do east and west ever meet? They're going in the opposite directions at all times. East and west never meet. It's kind of like one of those like whoa like questions like like when you're like in college and you're like in philosophy class and you're like whoa I kind of blew my mind a little bit but east and west never meets I can only ever be going east or I can ever be going west I can't be going both at the same time That's how far God has removed our transgressions from us 
In other words, it's this, <laughs> they're, they're, they're never, God and my sins are never going like, to meet up again. That's how far he has removed them. Let's see, I think 13 is still, we got one. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. What's the personal application there? Yeah, the love of a father. And, and this is one of those verses where you go, I think most people can probably understand this verse. You know, there are going to be people who don't have that good earthly father or never ha in their lives or never had that good earthly father in their lives. So this is one that's maybe hard to understand from a certain point there. But for those who have had a good father and know how much their father loves them, that's how... Even more so, the Lord looks at us as his children. And, uh, of course, earthly fathers are, are sinful, as, as sinful, so their love is no, always not a perfect love. That's the exact opposite of, of God. He's got a perfect fatherly love. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you're right about that. God is a personal God. He's not just... He's not out there in space somewhere. Um, he's actually, you know, my father. That, that has a relationship tone built into it. Like I talk to my, my dad um, at least once a week on, on Sundays usually. So, I mean, we have there, that personal communication that, that he knows me, I know him, you know. We laugh, we cry. Mostly we laugh. And then we got one more, I think, 14 through 16. So three verses we have to apply to ourselves. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Let's take that one by itself. That, that goes with the previous verse of how, how God is our father. And it, and it ends by saying, he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. What's the personal application there? God knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. And that's why he loves us. Or one of the reasons why he loves us. Well, we created When a person makes something, it's usually a personal or a personal Yeah, when a person makes something, particularly with their hands, you know, there's a there's a pride you take in that. There's a you know, this is my thing, and God did that for you know. And he's kind of alluding back to Adam and Eve, right? When God formed Adam and Eve, he didn't he he created Adam and Eve very differently than the rest of the world because the rest of the world he just said, "Let there be," and there was. With Adam and Eve, he actually formed with his hands, so to speak, even though God doesn't have hands, but he formed with his hands Adam and Eve as his special creation. What else does that mean? It, you know, God has love on us, and he remembers that we are dust. He knows we're weak and frail, and that we will end up dying and returning to dust. Yeah. Yeah, he knows that we're weak and frail. And he knows that ultimately we're all going to turn back into dust when we die. So he treats us accordingly. He doesn't treat us, you know, he treats, going back to that father picture, you know, a father doesn't treat their child as he would another adult. That's just, you know, that wouldn't make sense. He treats a child as frail, as something to be protected and cared for. So that's how he treats us. All right, and then 15 and 16. For the life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like the flower of the field. For the wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. Kind of goes with what we just said in verse 14, but how do we apply those words to our lives? Lives are short. Our lives here are short. God knows that. <laughs> yeah. 
God knows our lives here aren't short. He treats us accordingly. He gives us our time of grace here on earth to come to him. So he's not going to push us away from him. And even though the world will not remember me, right, the, 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 the place in the field doesn't remember the flower, right? It just keeps on going. Uh, the world's not going to remember me. You know, maybe the people around me will remember me after I die and, you know, the next generation later. But after that, you know, how often do you think of your great-great-grandma? Not very often. I do. Your great-great-grandma? Yeah, I do. All right, then you're better than me. Because I don't think of uncle or a grandpa. Let's see, Grandpa Martin was my grandpa. Grandpa... What was his father's name? Something Herman. Herman was his father's name. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what his father's name was. I'd have to look it up. But I don't think about him very often. I mean, that was 200 years ago. I don't, I don't think of my grandpa that very often, to tell you the truth. I, I never met him. Although I have my middle name's named after him. Um, so we are, the world doesn't remember us because our time here is so short, but the Lord knows who we are and he remembers us. Number six, our lives are so very short, but God's love and mercy endures forever. And at what times in our lives is this especially meaningful? Yeah, I think when we get older. Yeah, you look back, well, that was fast, and, and the, our lives are short, but from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. So this is an everlasting love. Any other times in our lives when it's especially meaningful that while well, our lives are short, God's love and mercy endures forever? Mm -hmm. Always with us. I think maybe at a funeral. Not just your own funeral, but uh, well, at your own funeral, you won't be there. But uh, <laughs> at another person's funeral, to know that, that even though this life is over, God's love for them is still going on as they're in heaven. Um, if you're facing some sort of trial in life, whether it's probably like a health thing, and maybe you're not old, maybe you're younger, and you're in the hospital for some reason, it's like, well, life is short, but my God's love isn't. Maybe the love of a grandchild, being that this one is coming down to earth and we are allowed to leave her. Yeah, yeah. As the next generations come on and you're like, they got a whole life ahead of them and you know, the older you get, the less life you have ahead of you. But to know, even if I'm not there, God's still there taking care of them. In fact, that's usually what, as you know, when you, when you talk to someone on their deathbed, they're usually not concerned about where they're going. You know, I'm going to heaven. They're more concerned about my fa their family. Like, I don't know what's my family going to do without me. It's like, well, God's got that too. Just like he's had you. He's got them. Number seven, the mercy and love of God fills his people on earth and in heaven with such joy that they want to praise him for all his goodness. What are some of the ways that we praise God? That kind of goes back to verses one and two. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul. How do we praise God? Yeah, be content, I think is a really good one, yeah. Uh, and through our prayers, ask, and, and prayers cover a whole bunch of things. When we, when we pray, don't forget to just pray for what you want, but pray for uh, 
in thanksgiving and be content. Singing, big part of praising. I mean, the Psalms were meant to be sung. Spread his word, yeah. Tell tell other people about the, the, the good works, the glorious works of the Lord. Live your life as an example. Live your life as an example to others, yeah. How do we praise the Lord? Praise the Lord, my soul. How does your soul praise the Lord? Rely on him, trust in him. Praise the Lord, my soul. Look at the things that he has done. Sending the son to pay for our sins. Take that away. Yeah. Going back to God's word and saying, wow, you know, God, you sent your son to die for me. That's That's amazing. I think, uh, praise the Lord my soul, trust in him, believe in him, have faith in him. That's, that's how we praise him, by, by looking, at as, looking at him as our father who loves us. By turning to Christ in repentance and trusting that he has removed our transgressions from us as far as the east is from the west. Anything else on how we praise God? Show respect to others. Yeah, show respect, submit ourselves to sub, submit yourselves to others out of reverence to Christ. Live, don't live for yourself. Um, pass your faith on to the next generation. Just our, our whole life is one of praise. Any comments on Psalm 103, a thanksgiving or a praising psalm? Also a didactic psalm, as it explains the mercy of God and his grace without ever using those two words. Another good psalm by King David. Let's look at the conclusion there. This psalm gives us one of the most vivid and clear expositions of gospel comfort in all of the Old Testament. God looks at our pitiful situation and he takes action. He forgives all of our sins. He heals all our diseases. He saves us from eternal punishment in hell. His love is boundless and his compassion is always timely. He is always loving, forgiving, and compassionate. God grant us wisdom to remember his promises in time of need. May we praise the Lord and forget not all his benefits. And kind of when you think about it, and you think about the man who is writing this psalm, David, how much he must have appreciated and personally applied these words to his own life as, as, uh, as far as his sins being removed. All right, any closing thoughts? I think that uh, Psalm 103 is probably one of the most beautiful psalms compared to, uh, I would say, other than Psalm 23. Yeah, I think so, yeah. I think... Uh, it encompasses everything. It really does cover a lot of ground, and, and I think the, the author of this study is right, that this is one of the clearest expositions of, of the gospel in the Old, probably in the Old Testament, um, as... as God is revealed as a forgiving God. Let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, you know how our sins and our guilt and shame uh, creep up on us and bother us. We, you know that we can't get rid of that on our own, and that's why you sent your son Jesus to this earth to die on the cross for our sins and to rise from the grave for our salvation. It is amazing that you have done such a thing for us. This is only because of your compassionate love for us and not because we have earned or deserved it. Lord, we praise your holy name for what you have done, not only for us, but for the whole world. 
You bless us in immeasurably gracious ways. Help us not to lose sight of that fact, that everything we have and are is because of you. May we tell others of your great works, and may the joy that you are our Father give us contentment and peace in our lives until we join you in the glorious paradise of heaven. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.